Hi everyone, welcome back, or if you're new here, welcome. It's Nurse Jenny here from Nurse Life Academy, and I will be reviewing gastrointestinal questions and concepts that you must know for the CCRN exam. I will time mark this video, so feel free to just scroll through at your own pace, but I do give extra information and explanations after every question. I would greatly appreciate if you like and subscribe to my video if you found it helpful, also so that you can be notified of other videos that are dropping. Without further ado, let's get into the GI content. Question number one. The following answers are true in the setting of liver failure, except A. Jaundice may be present in both acute and chronic liver failure. B. The development of hepatic renal syndrome is related to high mortality. C. Lactulose is used to treat hepatic encephalopathy due to liver failure. Or D. Alcohol abuse is the leading cause of acute liver failure. And the answer here is D. Alcohol abuse is the leading cause of acute liver failure. This is because alcohol abuse is the leading cause of chronic liver failure, but the leading cause of acute liver failure is acetaminophen. And all of the other answer choices are true. So let's talk a little bit about the liver and what it does. The liver filters medications and it filters toxins. Most significantly, it filters ammonia or NH3. It also synthesizes plasma proteins, which make albumin and coagulation factors such as prothrombin, fibrinogen, and other clotting factors. Now, acute hepatic failure is characterized by the inflammation of the liver, hepatic necrosis with significant destruction of hepatic cells, encephalopathy due to ammonia accumulation, and jaundice due to increased bilirubin. It's important to know that in acute hepatic failure, there is no portal hypertension present. In chronic failure, there is portal hypertension, and that comes from the liver scarring, which impedes filtering. Now let's talk specifically about acute hepatic failure. The most common cause of acute hepatic failure is acetaminophen overdose. And whether or not it's an intentional overdose or it's an unintentional overdose, sometimes that can happen in chronic supratherapeutic acetaminophen use. It can certainly cause hepatic problems either way. Other causes of acute hepatic failure can be viral in nature, they can include acute hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis, or they can be toxin-induced. Any of these causes, but specifically acetaminophen overdose, can lead to fulminant hepatitis, and that simply means that it is severe and sudden in onset. And in severe hepatitis, you will see a rapid progression over hours or days to severe destruction of hepatocytes and severe encephalopathy. In reviewing the labs for hepatic failure, our ammonia level is going to be elevated. And the ammonia level tells you how well the liver is filtering. And in liver failure, it's not doing a good job. So that ammonia is going to build up. Your liver enzymes, AST, ALT will be elevated, and our PTINR and PTT will be elevated because remember that the liver makes coagulation factors. But when it isn't working properly, it can't make the prothrombin, the fibrinogen, and those other clotting factors. Also, the liver can't properly release bilirubin in the form of bile when it's injured, and that leads to a backup of bilirubin in the body. And that's where you see your jaundice come from. Just a little side note, but scleral jaundice is one of the first places that you will see jaundice visibly. Now let's look at our lab values that trend downwards. So hepatic failure will certainly result in low levels of albumin since the liver isn't producing enough plasma proteins which make that albumin. And that's why these patients have such bad third spacing and ascites. Their body is hypoalbuminemic, so it does not keep fluid in those vessels. Additionally, platelets and fibrinogen will be low due to the lack of clotting factors we just talked about. And also your glucose will be low because the liver plays a role in gluconeogenesis or making that glucose. 
the treatment for acute hepatic failure well, if the cause is acetaminophen overdose, you will administer mucomist or N-acetylcysteine. You will certainly want to decrease ammonia levels by administering lactulose or decreasing protein intake if they are encephalopathic. And since the liver has a large part in medication filtration, providers may need to adjust medication doses to appropriate levels and as a nurse, just being careful when we're administering benzodiazepines, since these patients can't exactly filter benzos very well. So if they're already encephalopathic and you give them benzos, they might be zonked for a long time. You also may need to administer clotting factors if the patient needs them, because remember, they're lacking those platelets and fibrinogen, and their PTINR and PTT will be elevated. Last but not least, if their hepatic failure is fulminant or if it's severe in nature, they may even need a liver transplant. Question number two. Which of the following statements is correct regarding nutritional therapy? A. Parenteral nutrition is preferred over enteral nutrition. B. Hold tube feeding if diarrhea develops. C. Assess the placement of the feeding tube by inflating air and auscultating. D. Avoid bolus feedings in patients who are at high risk for aspiration. And the answer here is D. Avoid bolus feedings in patients who are at high risk for aspiration. Nutritional therapy is used for patients who are unable to maintain adequate nutritional intake, and this can be for a variety of reasons. Enteral nutrition, meaning nutrition going into the stomach, is preferred over parenteral nutrition, which goes into the vein. That would be like your TPN or your PPN. And the reason for this is that enteral nutrition is associated with fewer complications, but it also maintains gut function and gut anabolism, which you would lose if you did parenteral nutrition. It's also less costly. For the CCRN, it's important to know the latest evidence-based practice literature, which I've listed here. So you want to make sure that you're maintaining the head of bed of at least 30 degrees, generally 30 to 45. You want to obtain radiographic confirmation of tube placement, so that means you're getting a chest x-ray to confirm your tube. You do not want to inflate air and auscultate. That is not evidence-based practice. You want to mark the tube's exit site from the nose or the mouth with an indelible marker, meaning that it won't wash away. You want to avoid bolus tube feedings in patients who are at high risk for aspiration. Instead, put them on a slower rate, but a continuous feeding. You do not want to hold tube feeding if diarrhea develops, and you do not add dye to enteral feedings. Question number three. You are taking care of a patient who is admitted after an MVC. Your patient states that his airbag went off and he felt his seatbelt forcefully restrain his body in his seat. He has multiple bruises and abrasions all over. His main complaint is sharp left shoulder pain at rest. Which of the following may be the cause? Is it A, a pulmonary contusion, B, rotator cuff injury, C, a fractured left scapula, or D, a ruptured spleen? And the answer here is D, a ruptured spleen. So it looks like this patient was in a motor vehicle accident and he potentially sustained internal gastrointestinal trauma. An internal GI trauma may not necessarily be visible, but you have to follow the symptoms and the physical assessment for these patients. So the question says that he has multiple bruises and abrasions all over, and he has this sharp left shoulder pain at rest. He also had the seat belts that forcefully restrained his body in his seat. So this shoulder pain is actually referred pain from a ruptured spleen. So what we just went through in the last question is described as Kerr's sign. 
And I know that there are so many signs, so that's why I have all these weird little ways of remembering everything. But for me, Kerr, K-E-H-R, has four letters, and left has four letters, and they both have E's in them. I know it's a tiny detail, but just remember that Kerr's sign results in left shoulder pain due to this diaphragmatic irritation, which most commonly is a result of a ruptured spleen. And so this pain is actually a referred pain. And that means that it occurs when you have an injury in one area of your body, but you feel pain in a different area. And that happens because all of the nerves in your body are part of this huge connected network. And so in the case of a ruptured spleen and diaphragm irritation, that pain travels upward to the left shoulder. Some other signs you want to look out for for a ruptured spleen include absent bowel sounds and abdominal distension. And if for any reason you hear bowel sounds in the chest, that means that you have a ruptured diaphragm on your hands and your abdominal organs have moved upwards into your chest, which is not good. This will lead to respiratory failure and extremely quick deterioration. So big takeaway here is that Kerr's sign is left shoulder pain, and this is from diaphragm irritation, most likely due to a ruptured spleen. Question number four. Fluid and electrolyte balance require close monitoring for a patient with acute pancreatitis due to which of the following? Is it A, increased diuresis secondary to pancreatic enzyme release, B, increased incidence of hypercalcemia, C, increased capillary permeability resulting in fluid loss from the vascular space, or D, hypoglycemia due to pancreatic cell destruction? And the answer here is... C. Increased capillary permeability resulting in fluid loss from the vascular space. So acute pancreatitis triggers a systemic inflammatory response which results in the release of inflammatory mediators. And this leads to increased vascular permeability or this capillary leak which results in fluid loss from the vascular space and vasodilation. So it's important to monitor fluid and electrolyte balance in these patients because these massive fluid shifts may result in hypovolemic shock. The pancreas is composed of a head, a body, and a tail. And it kind of lies from the right middle part of the body to the left. And it has an endocrine gland which secretes insulin and glucagon. And it also has an exocrine gland which releases digestive enzymes and it secretes bicarbonate to neutralize stomach acid. Now in acute pancreatitis, there's this diffuse inflammation, there's destruction and autodigestion of the pancreas because digestive enzymes are activated prior to the release from the pancreas. So those digestive enzymes are just sitting there. They're just digesting the pancreas away because something activated those enzymes early. And when the pancreas starts auto-digesting itself, the body is like, what in the world is going on? This is not right. So it triggers a systemic inflammatory response, also known as SIRS. And just like we talked about, it releases inflammatory mediators it increases vascular permeability or this capillary leak, which results in fluid loss from the vascular space, and you also have vasodilation. But we have to ask ourselves, what happens in the body that those enzymes get activated early and they end up self-destructing that pancreas? Why would the pancreas betray itself like that? Well, most of the time, it's due to an obstruction of the pancreatic duct, which doesn't allow those digestive enzymes to flow through it. So these activated enzymes get stuck in the pancreas and they begin auto-digesting that pancreas instead of flowing through and digesting in the duodenum as intended. 
And the two main causes of this pancreatic duct obstruction are ETOH use or alcohol use and gallstones. Some other causes of acute pancreatitis can be abdominal surgeries, drugs, trauma, or infection, but the two big ones are going to be your ETOH use and your gallstones. Question number five. Management of acute pancreatitis includes which of the following? A. Antibiotics for all patients. B. A close lung assessment for all patients. C a nasogastric tube for all patients, or D, avoiding narcotics for all patients. The answer here is B, a close lung assessment for all patients. So let's keep the conversation going about acute pancreatitis. What is a patient who has acute pancreatitis going to look like? Well, they're going to have this boring upper abdominal pain, which may radiate to the back because of that inflamed pancreas. They'll also have a distended abdomen with absent or decreased bowel sounds. They may have nausea, vomiting, fever, hypotension, tachycardia. So they're kind of looking like a septic patient here, but they're technically not septic, they're inflamed. These patients may also have pulmonary problems. And why is that? Well, it's because the pancreas lies right underneath that diaphragm. So it can irritate the diaphragm and it can cause lung issues, most likely on the left side, such as left lower lobe atelectasis, left pleural effusion and infiltrates. These patients can also have pulmonary edema and crackles because of this inflammatory response, which makes those capillaries become leaky and the patient third spacing fluid. So they can certainly develop ARDS. So make sure that these patients have a close lung assessment and to monitor for signs of respiratory distress. There are a few signs associated with acute pancreatitis due to low levels of calcium, and these are Trousseau's and Schwastik's sign. Trousseau's sign is when there is a muscular hand or forearm spasm during inflation of the blood pressure cuff, and Schwastik's sign is a twitching of the facial muscles when tapping on the facial nerve. Again, both are signs of hypocalcemia. What are some of our other labs gonna look like in acute pancreatitis? Well, our lipase and our amylase are two digestive enzymes found in the pancreas. Those will absolutely be elevated in the setting of acute pancreatitis. And something to know is that lipase stays elevated for longer, so it is a more trustworthy measure between the two. Additionally, we'll have a high white blood cell count because of that SIRS response. We'll have a high blood glucose due to injury of the pancreatic beta cells. We will have hypocalcemia, and that's because calcium is used up for autodigestion, and it also binds with fatty acids from necrotic fat. We'll have a low albumin due to leaky capillaries, and potassium and magnesium will also be low due to malabsorption. Treatment for acute pancreatitis includes fluid replacement. However, you must be careful with fluids as to not worsen their respiratory status, especially if they already have crackles or arts. You want to replete their electrolytes, specifically keeping calcium, potassium, and magnesium levels normal. Pain management is going to be important for these patients due to the severity of their pain. They may need an NG tube to suction to decrease gastric secretions and to help rest that pancreas. And we can even start enteral feeding below the level of that duodenum. These patients will need glucose control, so remember they'll be hyperglycemic and will need some extra insulin. And of course, if I may have forgotten to mention how important respiratory status is in these patients, monitor their respiratory status for any acute changes. Question number six, which of the following laboratory findings would be expected in a patient with acute pancreatitis? A, hypercalcemia and hypoglycemia, B, hypocalcemia and hyperglycemia, C, 
hypoglycemia and hypocalcemia, D, hyperglycemia and hypercalcemia. I hope everyone got this one correct. The answer here is B, hypocalcemia and hyperglycemia. Question number seven. You notice a left hand spasm when inflating a blood pressure cuff on the patient's left arm. The patient was admitted for acute pancreatitis. Which of the following is the most likely cause? A, positive schwastic sign, hypercalcemia, B, positive Trousseau sign, hypocalcemia, C, positive Koenig sign, hypocalcemia, or D, positive Cullen sign, hypercalcemia. And the answer here is B, positive Trousseau sign associated with hypocalcemia. I know we've talked about the presence of hypocalcemia in acute pancreatitis patients, and we know that they're hypocalcemic because calcium is used up for autodigestion, but there are two signs that I wanted to cover that are associated with hypocalcemia that you need to know. And these low calcium levels end up resulting in neuromuscular irritability, which you'll see in both Schwastik's and Trousseau's signs. So on the left here, Schwastik's sign is going to be seen when gently tapping on the outer cheek. And you'll see a twitching or a spasm of the facial muscles, which can be seen in the twitching of the lip and cheek here. On the right side here, you have Trousseau's sign, which is a twitching and flexion of the hand and the thumb when the blood pressure cuff is inflated. Again, these are both due to neuromuscular irritability caused by low calcium levels in acute pancreatitis. Question number eight. A patient is admitted with hepatic failure, ascites, and hepatic encephalopathy. Which of the following treatments should the nurse anticipate? Is it A, provide higher doses of insulin to treat hyperglycemia, B, provide sedation with benzodiazepines, C, treat dehydration with lactated ringers, or D, treat ascites with spironolactone or aldactone. The answer here is D, treat ascites with spironolactone. So for patients with hepatic failure, you want to do everything in your power to not increase the amount of ammonia in their blood, as this is going to worsen hepatic encephalopathy. And for this specific question, the answer here is D, because this patient in hepatic failure with ascites and encephalopathy is going to need a diuretic. But not just any diuretic, it needs to be a potassium sparing diuretic, such as spironolactone. You do not want your hepatic failure patients to be hypokalemic because it can trigger ammonia production in the kidneys and could potentially cause a secondary acidosis. The answer isn't A, because patients with liver failure tend to develop hypoglycemia, not hyperglycemia like in pancreatitis. B is not correct because sedation should be avoided since it can one, mask encephalopathy, but also two, with liver failure patients, benzodiazepines, which are metabolized by the liver, will stay in the system for longer. So you don't want to give those and keep them sedated for long periods of time. Lastly, C is not correct because lactated ringers may result in acidosis if the patient can't metabolize that lactate, and it can also lead to an increased ammonia as well. So 0.9 normal saline is the preferred isotonic solution for these patients. Question number nine. You are taking care of a patient admitted for acute pancreatitis. He has developed Cullen's sign. Which of the following has the patient most likely developed? A, acute hepatic failure, B, 
esophageal varices, C, small bowel obstruction, or D, hemorrhagic pancreatitis. The answer here is D, hemorrhagic pancreatitis. Now, necrotizing pancreatitis is the most severe form of pancreatitis, and it results in necrosis of the pancreas itself, but also necrosis of the peripancreatic tissue and fat, so they might bleed. And that's why this is also known as hemorrhagic pancreatitis. And if they bleed, you may see Cullen sign, which is that blue discoloration and ecchymosis of the periumbilical area. I like to remember Cullen sign because they both have a C and a U in them, Cullen's umbilicus, or some people like to remember it if you form a C around your belly button, that's where you'll see Cullen sign. You may also see Gray Turner sign. If you guys remember, this is a sign of retroperitoneal bleeding. And remember, you have to turn your patient to see their flank bleeding. So gray turner side. Another complication of necrotizing pancreatitis is hypovolemic shock. So watch out for these signs and symptoms, as well as the sequestration of fluids in the peritoneum, which may require a peritoneal drain. Question number 10. You are caring for a patient with ESLD, or end-stage liver disease, admitted with confusion, elevated ammonia, and ascites. The patient's blood pressure is 80 over 46. What is the best immediate intervention to improve the blood pressure? Is it A, give a one liter fluid bolus over 20 minutes? B, position the patient on his side? C, start a dopamine infusion at five mics per kg per min? Or D, administer lactulose? The answer here is B, position the patient on his side. So you don't want to give fluid because they're going to third space that fluid since they have low levels of albumin and all of that ascites is going to push up on their IVC. So what you want to do immediately is position the patient on their side because that's going to relieve that pressure on the IVC. It probably would be a good idea to administer lactulose. However, that is not the immediate intervention for this patient since he is hypotensive. End-stage liver disease is characterized by scarring and fibrosis, wherein healthy hepatic cells are destroyed and they're replaced by fibrotic tissue which does not do what a healthy liver does. So it doesn't filter those toxins, filter medications, and create these plasma proteins such as albumin and clotting factors as well as a healthy liver does. And in end-stage liver disease and chronic liver disease, portal hypertension will be present since that fibrosis and cirrhosis of the liver significantly increases hepatic resistance and portal vein flow, it leads to this increased portal vein pressure and over time, portal hypertension. And this increase in portal vein pressure ends up traveling upwards. And it also increases the blood pressure inside the veins in the lower esophagus and the stomach. And since those veins aren't designed for higher pressures, they begin to expand, which is how these patients end up developing esophageal varices. Of course, we'll also have encephalopathy from the buildup of ammonia, which the liver can't filter. And lastly, there is hepatorenal syndrome, which is kidney injury due to liver failure, because when the liver fails, it takes the kidneys down with it. And now what causes this chronic end-stage liver disease? The number one cause of chronic liver disease is chronic alcohol use. Drinking significantly destroys those hepatocytes and scar tissue ends up replacing healthy tissue. 
Some other causes include fatty liver disease from obesity or diabetes or chronic hepatitis. And these patients are going to present with altered mental status due to hepatic encephalopathy. They can present with hypotension, shortness of breath from their ascites. They could be jaundiced. And again, that will appear in the sclera first. They can have something called asterixis due to high ammonia levels. And this is when you ask a patient to hold out their hands and their hands kind of do this like flapping, tremoring motion. Now, how are we going to treat end-stage liver disease? Well, if your liver is completely cirrhotic, there really isn't that much that we can do short of a liver transplant, but we certainly want to treat the cause if we can. So we want them to eliminate ETOH from their diet. We want to treat their symptoms as best as we can and give that supportive care. We can also do what's called a TIPS procedure and this stands for transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. You don't need to memorize that, but you do need to know what a TIPS procedure is. This is for patients with end-stage liver disease and cirrhosis. And what the surgeons do is they relieve portal hypertension by inserting a stent. And that stent shunts blood from the hepatic vein into the portal vein and it bypasses the liver. And this helps decrease portal hypertension, which in turn also helps relieve esophageal varices and ascites. These patients will generally have ascites due to the low albumin levels and their portal hypertension. And when patients have ascites, we do usually put them on a fluid restriction. We give them potassium sparing diuretics such as aldosterone antagonists, so your spironolactone or your loop diuretics. We also want to make sure that we're measuring their abdominal girths and daily weights. It's going to be important to position these patients optimally. And what I mean by this is that these patients will have these large, fluid-filled bellies that may be pushing up on their diaphragm and pushing up on their IVC. And this is where we get the symptoms of hypotension and shortness of breath. So you preferably want to position these patients either lying on their side or in reverse Trendelenburg in order to decrease that pressure pushing up on the inferior vena cava. You certainly want to monitor these patients' urine output and look for signs of hepatorenal syndrome. Definitely not a first-line treatment, but if needed, you can do a paracentesis, which is a temporary resolution. Most patients in end-stage liver failure will need weekly or bi-weekly paracentesis in order to keep draining that fluid that accumulates. Question number 11. A patient has a Sinkstaken Blakemore tube or an esophageal balloon tube for the treatment of bleeding esophageal varices. Which of the following is specific to the care of a patient with an esophageal balloon tube? Is it A? Initiate fluid resuscitation. B. Monitor for overt bleeding. C. Administer an H2 antagonist. Or D. Keep scissors at the bedside. And the correct answer here is D. Keep scissors at the bedside. So in the event that the tube becomes displaced and it moves up, the esophageal balloon may obstruct the airway and result in an acute airway emergency. I know we briefly touched on esophageal varices, but we'll talk about them a little bit more here. So esophageal varices are dilated engorged veins in the esophagus. And how do they get to be dilated and engorged? Well, cirrhosis prevents normal drainage through the liver, which results in portal hypertension. And with portal hypertension, those high pressures also back up into the esophageal veins, which is what causes these varices. And if these varices burst, which they have a high likelihood of doing since there is high pressure from that portal hypertension, then you're kind of in trouble. Bleeding esophageal varices can lead to hypovolemic and hemorrhagic shock, so we certainly want to prevent that from happening if we can. 
Endoscopically, patients can undergo banding or sclerotherapy of varices. And if varices do bleed uncontrollably, we can insert an esophageal balloon, which is pictured on the upper right-hand side here. We absolutely want to make sure that we don't forget our ABCs in this patient, and we can begin octreotide or vasopressin, which both are medications that decrease portal venous pressures. However, we do need to use vasopressin with caution for patients with cardiac diseases, specifically coronary artery disease, as it can decrease myocardial blood flow and cause ischemia, so watch out for ST changes or chest pain. So an esophageal balloon, also known as a Singstaken Blakemore tube, basically tamponades or it pushes on and occludes those varices to stop them from bleeding. And for esophageal balloon insertion, the patient will need to be intubated since there's a chance that the esophageal balloon could migrate up and it could occlude that airway. So always keep scissors at the bedside so that you can cut that tube, which would then deflate the balloon and resolve your respiratory distress. Question number 12. Your patient is two hours post gastric bypass surgery, a ruin why? Which of the following parameters should be monitored closely following surgery? A. Lactose intolerance. B. Protein levels and vitamin deficiencies. C. Heart rate, respiration rate, temperature, white blood cell count, and MAP. D. Rapid weight loss. And the answer here is C. Heart rate, respiration rate, temperature, white blood cell count, and MAP. So with any kind of surgical patients, you absolutely want to watch out for infection, but especially for patients who have undergone gastric bypass surgery, where there are usually two to three anastomoses made in the abdomen, and they are at high risk for leakage of intestinal content into their peritoneal cavity because of these anastomoses. So we must watch out for SIRS and sepsis infection criteria, such as these listed here. The RU-NY procedure, or gastric bypass surgery, is a type of bariatric surgery where the small intestine is anastomosed to the upper portion of the stomach to create a gastric pouch which is small, and it holds up to about 30 cc's. And this surgery is elective for patients who are obese and would like to lose weight with the help of a surgical option. It can either be laparoscopic, where they make small incisions in the abdomen and use a camera to help guide them, which is a lot more common since these patients are at high risk for infection and complications, or it can be open, where they do actually cut open the abdomen and have a larger surgical incision. Obese individuals eat large amounts of calories and have small stomachs, so the purpose of this surgery is to bypass the stomach so that it can only hold a certain amount of food, and this prevents patients from eating large amounts of food, thus eating less calories, and then losing weight. And these patients must eat small, frequent, soft protein-based foods following surgery or else they run the risk of stretching that gastric pouch and potentially splitting the stitches of the anastomoses. Even if patients eat as advised, there still is a risk of anastomotic leak, which would include intestinal content leaking into the peritoneal cavity, which is a huge concern. Intestinal content leakage can result in severe infection, so again, you want to watch out for those signs of SIRS immediately following surgery. You also want to keep an eye out on the surgical sites as well. Whether it was laparoscopic or open, just make sure that you're monitoring them. For the long term, you want to watch out for signs of dumping syndrome, which is essentially rapid gastric emptying of food from your stomach into your small bowel too quickly after you eat, and this usually results in poor digestion and poor nutritional absorption, so again, having those frequent, small protein-focused meals are going to be important. 
Patients who've had bariatric surgeries can also have alteration in absorption, which results in vitamin deficiencies. So it's important to monitor those long-term. They can also have hypoglycemia, again, usually due to that dumping syndrome process. And lastly, about half of patients who get bariatric surgeries end up developing gallstones. Question number 13. Which of the following lab values would you expect to see in a patient with acute pancreatitis? A. Elevated amylase, lipase, and albumin. B. Elevated albumin, decreased amylase, and lipase. C. Decreased albumin, elevated amylase, and lipase. Or D. Decreased albumin, amylase, and lipase. The answer here is C, decreased albumin, elevated amylase, and lipase. This slide is just here for reference as we've talked about all of this previously. Question number 14. A patient's abdominal assessment reveals a complaint of dull abdominal pain, abdominal distension, low-pitched bowel sounds, and a report of a change in bowel habits. This patient most likely has which of the following problems? Is it A, a large bowel obstruction, B, acute pancreatitis, C, small bowel obstruction, or D, acute appendicitis? The answer here is a, a large bowel obstruction. You should be able to differentiate between a small bowel and a large bowel obstruction. In a small bowel obstruction, there is sharp, episodic pain. Bowel sounds are usually hyperactive early and they will be high-pitched. Then they'll be hypoactive later on. Some signs and symptoms include vomiting early these patients may projectile vomit, and it may even be fecal matter. They will also have abdominal distension, but it might not be as distended as with a large bowel obstruction because they are vomiting up and getting rid of a lot of their intestinal content. On the other hand, a large bowel obstruction will result in dull, vague pain. You will see hyperactive bowel sounds, but they will be low-pitched. And similar to a small bowel obstruction, both bowel sounds will be hypoactive later on. In a large bowel obstruction, vomiting will occur late, but patients will have a change in bowel habits, so maybe patterns of constipation and diarrhea, and they will also have abdominal distension as well. In both small and large bowel obstructions, if you shoot a KUB, there will be dilated loops of gas-filled bowel on both x-rays. And when it comes to treatment, the treatment is mostly the same for both. Of course, it certainly depends on the etiology of the bowel obstruction, but as always, you have airway, breathing, and circulation that will be your priorities. You want to give these patients adequate fluids and electrolyte replacements. You also want to treat their pain, probably putting in an NG tube so that you can drain their intestinal contents, and some patients may even need surgery if there is a strangulated hernia or a volvulus or adhesion. Question number 15. Your trauma patient is complaining of generalized abdominal pain. He has abdominal distension, shortness of breath, and decreased urine output. The surgical resident asks you to measure his intra-abdominal pressure. You do so and report back that it is 25 millimeters of mercury. Why do you suspect that intra-abdominal pressure is 25 millimeters of mercury? Is it A, hepatic failure, B, abdominal compartment syndrome, C, a large bowel obstruction, or D, constipation? The answer is B, abdominal compartment syndrome. Abdominal hypertension is just a term which means increased intra-abdominal pressure. And what's the big deal with it? 
Well, if pressure in the abdominal cavity becomes greater than the pressure in the vessels that perfuse the abdominal organs, ischemia and infarction may occur, which can lead to serious complications. Some causes of abdominal hypertension include massive fluid resuscitation and over-resuscitation, could be trauma or major abdominal surgeries. Signs and symptoms of abdominal hypertension usually include abdominal distension. If you have a Foley and can measure a bladder pressure, it will be greater than 12 millimeters of mercury. There will be decreased urine output as it starts affecting other organs. You can see respiratory compromise or decreased cardiac output. And the most severe form of abdominal hypertension is called abdominal compartment syndrome which is when intra-abdominal pressures are greater than 20. This is an emergency and decompressive surgery via laparotomy will be indicated. Usually the surgeons will leave the abdomen open as to let it breathe per se or help with all of that extra pressure. And you certainly wanna keep an eye on these patients' intra-abdominal pressures as well as optimizing the patient's position by placing them in reverse Trendelenburg. You certainly don't want to have their head of the bed elevated, which could further compromise the pressure in their abdomen, as well as their respiratory and cardiovascular status. And lastly, we have a bonus question. Your patient who was admitted for a bowel obstruction complains of abdominal pain, which worsens with movement. He has rebound tenderness, absent bowel sounds, and a KUB with free air in the peritoneum. You would expect the rest of the patient's abdominal assessment to include which of the following? A, a rigid abdomen. B, an intra-abdominal pressure of five. C, a soft and tender abdomen. Or D, dull intermittent abdominal pain. The answer is A, a rigid abdomen. The patient being described here has all of the signs and symptoms of a gastric perforation, so they're going to have a rigid abdomen. Otherwise, an intra-abdominal pressure of 5 is normal, since normal IAP pressures are 5 to 10, and abdominal pain with a gastric perf is going to be severe. Now, bowel perforation is a rare but serious and even fatal issue. And this occurs when there is leakage of gastrointestinal content into the peritoneal cavity. And this leakage of GI content and bacteria leads to an infection and an inflammation of the peritoneum known as peritonitis. Some causes of bowel perforation include bowel obstruction, appendicitis, penetrating wounds, ulcerative colitis, or ulcers. And signs and symptoms that you'll see will include a rigid abdomen, severe abdominal pain, rebound tenderness that increases with movement or coughing, you'll have absent bowel sounds, nausea, vomiting, and free air on a KUB. You will certainly see these patients presenting with symptoms of SIRS, such as tachycardia, tachypnea, fever, and an elevated white blood cell count. The treatment here are again, of course, your ABCs, but this will be a surgical emergency where they will have to do an abdominal washout of all of that leaked gastrointestinal content, and they will repair the perforation. Some patients may need a temporary bowel diversion to help them heal, and they usually will have a nasogastric tube to decompression. You'll have fluid, electrolytes, pain control, and antibiotics as part of the treatment plan as well. All right, we have made it to the end. If you liked the video or found it helpful, please like and subscribe to my channel. I would greatly appreciate it. As always, let me know if you have any questions. I would be more than happy to help. Thank you so much for watching and all of your support. If you guys are taking your CCRN soon, you can absolutely do this. So good luck. You've got this. Thanks, guys. Nurse Jenny signing off for Nurse Life Academy. Have a good one.